Today is an exciting day. .NET 10 has just been released as part of the .NET Conf 2025. Hooray! In this video, I will give you my perspective on what's important for us .NET developers coming with .NET 10. By the end of the video, you'll have a broad understanding of what's important and what might be interesting to you. Everything you hear and see in this video is based on the release version of .NET 10. And all the code examples have been made using Visual Studio 2026, which also has been released today. Let's start with a quick overview of .NET 10, the latest LTS long-term service release with up to three years of support. At .NET Conf, Microsoft presented a familiar slide with the ecosystem for .NET development, including Microsoft Azure, Visual Studio, and other development tools. However, there's an entirely new application type on this slide, Agents. We can now build agents using the .NET Agent Framework, which is the unification of semantic kernel and autogen. I personally don't know anything about agents and AI development. If that's gonna change in the future, I'll let you know in another video. According to Microsoft, there are 7 million .NET developers and more than 68,000 contributors to the .NET repositories, which puts it in the top 5 of the most active open source projects. One of the most exciting things about today's .NET 10 release is the release of Visual Studio 2026. I successfully installed the Visual Studio 2026 stable version right after its release. I previously used the Insider version, which is the new name for the preview version. The third thing that comes to mind is the improved startup performance. Microsoft showed a demo where they opened an empty Visual Studio and it started as quickly as Visual Studio Code. Another big change is the new user interface. There are many different themes pre-installed that provide a more modern look and feel for the application. The first thing in Visual Studio 2026 I noticed was the improved build time. The application that I currently work in the most has a significantly reduced build time of about a fourth, so 25%. As I mentioned earlier in this video, I have only used Visual Studio 2026 for a few hours since its release. However, I highly recommend installing it and trying it yourself. Make sure to download it via the official website, because you need an updated version of the Visual Studio installer. Otherwise, only the inside version might be available. One of the most anticipated new feature in .NET 10 is file-based applications. It means that we can now create a simple .cs file instead of creating a solution and a project file. In this example, I opened Visual Studio Code and created an empty hello-world.cs file. We now use a console.writeline statement to print hello to the console. In any terminal, we simply use the .NET run command and provide the path to our .cs file to execute it. In file-based applications, we can also use the console arguments. Let's change the text in the writeline method and provide the name as an argument when calling the .NET run command. It's also possible to directly reference NuGet packages inside the .cs file with a completely new syntax. We use the hashtag or pound symbol followed by a colon and the package keyword. And we provide the name of the package such as serilog. We can now use the types included in that NuGet package within the application. It's also possible to convert a file-based application into a regular C-sharp project and solution using the .NET project convert command. I'll most likely record a dedicated video in the future where I go deeper into the specifics of file-based applications with .NET 10. It's an entirely new way to develop .NET applications and I'm curious to see what impact it will have on the whole ecosystem. There are many new features in .NET Aspire with .NET 10. 
And with today's release, version 13, they officially renamed it from .NET Aspire to just Aspire. I have to be completely honest with you, I'm not too deep into .NET Aspire. I tried it once or twice after the .NET Conf 2024, but to be honest, I can't even remember why I stopped going down the path and haven't explored it any further. I might give it another go with .NET 10. Now let's finally get into another, more exciting topic. With .NET 10, we also get C Sharp 14, the next version of the C Sharp compiler. And in this video, I'm going to show you two specific new C Sharp 14 features that I think will be used the most. First, let's explore null conditional assignments. Let's take a look at the following code. We have a developer class with an age property of type int. We also have a create developer method, which accepts the age as its argument. If the age is a positive value, the method returns a developer object and assigns the age to its property. However, if the age provided is not positive, the method returns null. We now use the create developer method and provide a positive value as its argument. Next, we set the age property. Now, the compiler tells us that the developer variable might be null. In this case, the code should run fine. However, if we want to account for the null case, we need to implement an if statement. With C Sharp 14, we get the null conditional assignment operator which allows us to write the same code more concisely. Instead of the if statement, we use the question mark in front of the dot operator. Now, if I run the program, it won't crash even though I provide a negative number and the value of the developer variable will be null. The second interesting C Sharp 14 feature is field backed properties. This example shows a time class with an hours property of type double. We cannot use an auto property because we want to check the value in the setter and throw an exception for negative numbers. Up to C Sharp 13, we needed to introduce the backing field and use it for the implementation of the getter and the setter. With C Sharp 14, we can use the new field keyword. As with every new C Sharp feature, it will take a few days or weeks to get used to it, but I can definitely see the upside of not having to declare a private field in such situations. There are many more exciting C Sharp 14 features, such as extension methods and extension fields. I will probably create a dedicated C Sharp 14 video in the future. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on this content. As with every iteration of .NET, we get better performance. And it's especially true when it comes to .NET and ASP.NET Core, the web application framework. We receive better performance across the board for minimal APIs, Blazor, SignalR, and every other part of the ASP.NET Core framework. The new support for WebAuthN and passkeys stands out. If you want to know what it is and how it works, I highly recommend watching the demo from Daniel Roth titled Build Better Web Apps with Blazor in .NET 10, linked in the video description. Now, let's finally talk about Blazor. It's the web application framework I regularly use at work, which allows me to implement modern cross-platform web applications using C Sharp and .NET. Hot Reload has been hit or miss with Blazor and .NET 9 in the past. It depended on how large the application was and what kind of change I wanted to perform. Sometimes it just took a long time, otherwise it didn't work at all and I had to restart the whole Blazor application only to see a small change on the user interface. With .NET 10, Hot Reload should have been improved a lot. Again, I only used it for a few hours and I couldn't verify it myself. However, according to the demos I saw at this year's .NET Conf, the .NET team really put a lot of effort into improving the Hot Reload experience for Blazor web application development. During the .NET Conf, Dan Roth showed a case where a simple user interface change took only 3 seconds to update 
with Visual Studio 2026, while it took almost 40 seconds in Visual Studio 2022. There is a large list of improvements that went into Blazor and .NET 10. The one new feature that stands out for me is persistent Blazor state. And I will record a dedicated video where I show how this new Blazor feature helps us persist the state when the user disconnects and reconnects to a Blazor server application. As usual, with every .NET iteration, we see significant performance improvements. It means that simply by upgrading to a newer .NET version, our applications will execute faster and use fewer resources. That's especially helpful when running in the cloud on a consumption-based plan. Similar to the previous years, Stephen Tobe published a 250-page long blog post explaining most of the performance improvements made in .NET 10. As I said at the beginning of this video, this is my perspective on how I see what's important for .NET developers with .NET 10 for their everyday work. I only had a few hours to explore the final release myself, yet I'm excited to see what the future holds in store for us. I invite you to download, install and explore .NET 10 and C Sharp 14 yourself. It's definitely an exciting time to be a .NET developer and I cannot wait to explore all the new features and the new things we got to do with .NET 10. And if you don't want to miss future videos on this channel where I go deeper into new .NET 10 and C Sharp 14 features, consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching and let me know what your favorite .NET 10 or C Sharp 14 feature is in the comments below. And I'll see you in the next video.